This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. You're listening to Kalam Institute's podcast series, Sira, Life of the Prophet, by Sheikh Abdul Nasir Jangda. Visit us on the web at kalaminstitute.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Kalam Institute. Bismillahi walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Asiratu Nabawiya, the prophetic biography. In the previous sessions we've been talking about the landmark event of Islamic history and the life of the Prophet ﷺ and that was the migration, the hijrah from Mecca to Medina. And we've talked about this in many different stages and phases uh, in different parts of the story as we've done throughout the entire you know, series on the life of the Prophet ﷺ here, the entire Sira podcast. We always try to um, take apart each incident no matter how, much, uh, how many sessions it requires and in detail try to break down each uh, aspect of these major events from the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And the hijrah itself is no different, is no exception to that. So when talking about the hijrah, the, the migration of the Prophet ﷺ from Mecca to Medina, we have discussed a few different elements of the, uh, of the incident. Where we left off last time was talking about the Prophet ﷺ in the cave of Thawr, seeking refuge, taking refuge from the people that were chasing after him. And then when the Prophet ﷺ leaves, after three days in the cave of Thawr with his travel companion, his best friend Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, may Allah be pleased with him, they depart from the cave of Thawr and we talked about how Suraqa bin Malik, this one of the individuals from Mecca, Suraqa bin Malik, comes after the Prophet ﷺ and is pursuing the Prophet ﷺ for the reward money that is being promised and offered for bringing the Prophet ﷺ back to Mecca or even killing him. And the miraculous event that takes place where the Prophet ﷺ, in one narration, he says, uh, he even makes dua, he turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and says, Oh Allah, handle him, take care of him for us. Um, Allahumma kfina hu bima shi'ta. Oh Allah, you handle him however you see fit. And how the legs of his horses, uh, of his horse keep singing and in, sinking into the ground. Like his horse is getting sucked down into the earth. And then the second that he backs away from there, the horse is able to come back out from the earth again, from the ground again. And this keeps happening, going on back and forth, back and forth. Uh, until he finally gives up and tells the Prophet ﷺ, fine, fine, I won't pursue you. And that's when the Prophet ﷺ tells him, that's fine, now don't tell anybody else where we're at and cover for us. And he offers the Prophet ﷺ some food or some supplies or something. And the Prophet ﷺ says, لا حاجة لي في ذلك. I don't need any of that. Just don't tell anybody that you saw us here. And he in fact goes back. And anybody that he sees on the way going that direction, he's looking for the Prophet ﷺ. He says, don't worry, I've already covered this route. It's all good. I've already covered this route. And when he gets back to Mecca, of course, then he keeps talking about this later on when he hears that the Prophet ﷺ has reached Medina, Quba. Then he starts talking about this incident and explaining how unbelievable it was. And he has even a back and forth with Abu Jahal, because Abu Jahal doesn't want him informing people of this miraculous incident. But nevertheless, we talked about that story and how eventually Suraqa bin Malik accepts Islam. So when they left from the cave of Thawr, and I kind of mentioned this before, but the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa I talked about this, where Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu had arranged two rides, two transportation for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and himself. And when he brings the transportation, the camels are brought, he says, Irkab fidaka abi wa ummi ya Rasulullah. Please, you know, um, you know, board the animal, get on top of the animal, O, o Messenger of Allah. May my father and mother be sacrificed for you. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Inni la arkabu ba'iran laysa li. I will not ride an animal that I personally have not purchased. No free rides here. 
Nobody gets a free ride. And this is from the ethics of the Prophet ﷺ, not to ever, ever, in the slightest bit, take any advantage of anyone, not even one of his most loyal followers, supporters, and friends. No, the Prophet ﷺ just did not set a precedent where anyone would ever take advantage of anybody else. Religious knowledge, religious leadership, spiritual leadership is not an excuse to take advantage of people. But the Prophet of Allah ﷺ set the bar very, very high and exemplified ethics and morality. That the more knowledgeable somebody is, the more spiritual they are, the more higher in the ranks of leadership that that person is, they are more obligated to display a higher level of character. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, لا أركب بعيرا ليس لي I will not ride an animal that does not belong to me. So Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, فَهِيَ لَكَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ I'm giving it to you, O Messenger of Allah. It's a gift for you. بِأَبِي أَنْتَ وَأُمِّي يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ I would sacrifice anything for you, O Messenger of God. I'm giving you this ride, this animal. He said, لا. He said, no. وَلَكِنْ مَثَّمَنُ الَّذِي إِبْتَعْتَهَا بِهِ he says, rather tell me how much did you purchase this animal for? How much did you purchase this transportation for? Then finally Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu al-amru fawqa al-adab, the Prophet sallallahu is commanding him. So the adab now takes a back seat. Obedience comes before any, you know, um, any form of, any type of formality, or any type of respect, or formality that we might have. Obedience comes before that. Obedience comes first. So he says, كَذَا وَكَذَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ He tells him, O Messenger of God, I purchased it for this much and this much. قَالَ أَخَذْتُهَا بِذَلِكَ That's how much I am purchasing it from you for. And then, هِيَ لَكَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Then Abu Bakr رضي الله تعالى says, Okay, O Messenger of Allah, I agree to the sale. Can you please now, you know, ride the animal? Can you please board the transportation so we can get going? But you see the ethics of the Prophet wasallam. And this camel that the Prophet wasallam was riding, I always try to interject, you know, these types of tidbits because this shows the depth. There's something actually really beautiful here. So, Al-Waqidi, rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the primary scholars of the seerah, and he draws this from the tabaqat of Ibn Sa'ad, who is one of the earliest and most authoritative historians in the history of Islam. He says that the camel of the Prophet ﷺ, the she-camel, the naqa that the Prophet ﷺ rode on this journey of hijrah, was named Al-Qaswa. Al-Qaswa. قَالَ وَكَانَ أَبُو بَكَرْ إِشْتَرَاهُمَا بِثَمَانُ مِيَا دِرْهَمْ وَرَوَى إِبْنُ عَسَاكِدْ مِنْ طَرِيقِ أَبِي أُسَامَ عَنْ هِشَامَ عَنْ أَبِهِ عَنْ عَائِشَ رضي الله تعالى عنها However, Ibn Asakir, and this is uh, also in the narration of Imam Bukhari, and this is mentioned in some other books of the seerah as well, such as Ar-Rawdu Al-Anf of uh, Alama Suhaili, another scholar, early scholar of, uh, of seerah, they actually narrate from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha that she said that the camel of the Prophet sallallahu on the journey of hijrah was named Al-Jada'a. Al-Jada'a. So one narration says this was the she-camel Al-Qaswa. One narration says this was the camel named Al-Jada'a. Now, what do we learn from exactly from that? First and foremost, you know, just in terms of the culture and the tradition of that place, that they would give these animals these names. And the Prophet ﷺ also maintained that tradition of giving animals names. And this does something very important. This actually gives the animals some dignity. It gives the animals some, sense, some dignity in the eyes of the owner and in the eyes of the people. It's a way to dignify an animal. You know, we have a lot of talk and a lot of discussion these days about animal rights and, and ethical, you know, humane treatment of animals. And unfortunately, very unfortunately, we see lots of very terrible and atrocious things going on today that a lot of people do with different animals, abuse and violence and all these different things, dog fighting and all this nonsense that goes on. This is all completely forbidden and prohibited in Islam. And what we have to remember is 1400 years ago, the Prophet ﷺ spoke about a lot of these ethics and this morality. Where the, the mushrikun of Makkah, the mushrikun pre-Islamically, 
pre-Islam. They had a practice where they would sometimes use birds for target practice. They would use a bird and use it for target practice, not like hunting. Hunting is something completely, and they also a lot of times people ask me, you know, this is, this is Texas, so people love their guns and love their hunting and all this kind of stuff. So people ask about hunting, and I tell them that if you hunt for sport, like just shooting animals for the sake of shooting animals, or putting trophies on the wall, لا يجوز. أبدا لا يجوز. It's not permissible. It's not permissible. Alright? But if you hunt, to actually like make use of the animal, like you will take the meat of the animal and you will utilize, eat the meat of the animal and you will make use of the skin of the animal. If that's the intention and the purpose behind it, then it's permissible. And it's only permissible up to need and necessity, not overindulgence. And specifically, like I was saying pre-Islamically, they had the practice of targeting birds. And the Prophet ﷺ came and he said, this is forbidden, haram, la yajuz. It's not permissible at all. And another thing that the Prophet ﷺ established, validated as a practice was, that the Prophet ﷺ would name these animals. And what, once again, what that does is that grants dignity to the animal. Alright, so this is the first thing, lesson that we learned from the fact that the difference of narrations, whether this camel was Al-Qaswa, or this camel was al jadaa but we learned something else very beautiful and powerful that feeds into why we are having this series on the life of the Prophet ﷺ to begin with. We, we learned something from this, one of the benefits, one of the fawaid that we take from this. The naming, what was the name of the camel, the she-camel of the Prophet ﷺ during the journey of Hijrah. We learn a lesson from this that, that explains to us exactly why the Sirah podcast even exists to begin with. That the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his life, his life, and every single detail in his life is so important, is so important in Islam, in the preservation of Islam, in the continuation of Islam, in the education of the ummah. It is so important that every single little intricate detail, even related, closely related, distantly related, to the life of the Prophet ﷺ has been preserved so much so, that scholars actually made exhaustive efforts, even to ascertain, even to pinpoint, what was the name of the she-camel that the Prophet ﷺ rode on the journey of Hijrah from Makkah to Medina. This is... and and. What, what I want everyone here, what I want all of us, myself, yourselves, all of us, those listening later, what I want everyone to really think about is, the generations that came before us. You know, we talk oftentimes about the golden age of Islam, and we'll talk about these past generations, and the salaf, and the predece pious predecessors, and the great imams, and the great scholars of the past. Well, what made them so great? What made them so great? What made them so amazing? What made those communities, those societies, the ummah, so unbelievable at that time? It was the dedication that they had. These were dedicated people. And they were so dedicated to their deen, they were so dedicated to Islam, to Allah and His Messenger wasallam, that they would actually exhaust themselves making efforts to even preserve and learn and teach what the name of the she-camel of the Prophet wasallam was. And before anybody tries to say something as superficial, and as simple-minded, and foolish, and feeble-minded, as to saying, well, what's the benefit in that? مَا فَائِدَ فِي ذلك. What's the benefit in knowing the name of the she-camel? Brother, you, we get hidayah, guidance, some akhlaq, some fiqh, some aqidah, something. What's the benefit of knowing the name of the she-camel? Really? How much useless information do we amass? about the most useless things in this world. How much useless information do we amass? We know the names of players on different sports teams. We know how many goals somebody scored, or how many points a game they scored, or how many touchdowns they threw. Or this is Dallas, so how many interceptions they've thrown lately. Right? It's painful, but it's the truth. Right? We, we, know, we, know, we know names of movies and movie actors, we know lyrics to songs, we know random, useless, pointless information about politicians of the world. How much do we know? 
How much do we make an effort to know and to, to understand? Knowing that about the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa is an actually a badge of honor. To know these details about the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa you know what it is? The more you know about somebody, the more you want to know about somebody, it displays and it demonstrates and it proves your love for that person. That's how much love you have for that person. This is a badge of honor for a believer. This is how much I love my Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa I cannot hear enough about him. I cannot learn enough about him. I cannot talk enough about him. This needs to be our engagement with the Qur'an and with the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. That needs to be our approach. We can never know enough or too much. Because it's an endless ocean of benefit. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided these, these sources for us. So moving along now, they depart from the cave of Thor, they have the incident, the run-in with Suraqa bin Malik, which we talked about in the previous session. Now they proceed forward, and there's a couple of very interesting incidents. Um, a couple of very fascinating experiences that not so much the Prophet ﷺ had, but other people had with the Prophet ﷺ. So one other very famous story and incident that occurred on the journey of the Hijrah, the migration from Mecca to Medina, is known as the Hadith of Ummu Ma'bad. Hadith of Ummi Ma'bad. Ummu Ma'bad was this woman, this elderly woman, who was, um, you know, she was like a Bedouin, like a villager woman, who lived out, you know, kind of like out in the countryside. She lived out there, and it was her and her husband, and some of the narrations also mention a couple of sons, a couple of children. And she lived way out there, and they were very simple, poor country folk. They didn't have much, they had a couple of goats, and that was pretty much it. And the husband had gone out with a few more goats that they had, to try to find some green patch of land somewhere, where he could go and graze some of the goats and some of the sheep that they had. And back at home, she just had a couple of goats, and that was pretty much it. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu are passing through there. While they're passing through there, they kind of stop nearby, and you know she sees them, and they go to her and they inquire. Some of the narrations mentioned they kind of went to her and inquired, like, is there any possibility of some hospitality or something? And understand that that's not like begging or asking or imposing. That was the culture of that time. That was understood. It was almost like the law of the land. Right? That's why I was explaining to the students as well in the, in the, at the seminary that when we read the story of Kahf, when we read the story of Kahf, and when Musa alayhi salam and Khidr, you know, they, they arrive in that town, and then when they arrive in that town and the people of that town don't provide any hospitality for them, why is that such a big deal? And then that's when they see the wall falling and Khidr starts repairing the wall. And Musa alayhi salam says, why didn't you just go ahead and get hired to do this job so they would have paid you? Why is that such a big deal? Why is he correcting him? Because it was considered to be like a law of the land at that time. It was like tribal law. It was an understood law. It was an unwritten rule that everyone abided by, that when you have travelers coming through, you offer something. You take care of them. They didn't have hotels and restaurants and this kind of stuff. So you take care of people that are passing through. It was understood. Alright, so the Prophet of Allah and Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala go to inquire that is there any opportunity, any you know, possibility of any hospitality. So she says, فَقَالَتْ وَاللَّهِ مَا عِنْدَنَا طَعَامٌ وَلَا لَنَا مِنْحَةٌ وَلَا لَنَا شَاتٌ إِلَّا حائل. She says, Wallahi, I swear to God, we don't have any food. We don't have any type of, you know, provision. We don't even have any animals that I could milk and provide milk for you. Except for one goat or sheep that is actually pregnant, expecting. And that's pretty much all that we have. Um, in another narration, she says that, you know, we, I have a couple of goats here. But none of them really have any milk or anything like that. And you know, they themselves are really malnourished. Even a couple of goats that I have here are very malnourished. So this is the conversation that they basically have. 
And so from here now, there's a couple of different narrations. One of the narrations that's very fascinating, and again you see the quality of this woman, Ummu Ma'bad. She act, he, the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Bakr ta'ala, in one narration, they go back to where they're kind of camped out, staying the night. They go back there, she eventually sends her, one of her sons with a knife and one of the goats. She says, take one of the goats, it's, it's a weak animal, but what can you do? We don't have anything better to present. Take one of the goats and take this knife, go over there, offer it to them and say they are free to slaughter the animal, build a fire for them and they can cook the meat and they can have it. So after she turns him down, she feels bad, she goes, fine, we'll just give one of the animals. It's not much, but I don't have anything else. And when the son comes to the Prophet ﷺ, he actually says, no, 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 you keep the knife, bring the goat here. And some of the other narrations, right then and there when she tells the Prophet ﷺ that I don't really have anything else, uh, we don't have any food or anything to give to you, I just have these malnourished goats or sheep, that's all we got. Then the Prophet of Allah ﷺ says, can I see some of the animals? Do you mind if I see some of the animals? She says, absolutely go. فَمَسَحَ ضَرَعَهَا بِيَدِهِ We've read about stories like this earlier, like when Abdullah bin Mas'ud رضي الله تعالى عنه became Muslim. So the Prophet ﷺ says, Bismillah makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَدَعَ اللَّهَ He makes dua to Allah, says Bismillah, and he touches the udder of the animal. And she says, it swelled up right in front of my eyes. And the Prophet of Allah ﷺ asked for some type of a bowl or a dish, and she had this huge pot, that's all she had. So he says, give it here. And the Prophet ﷺ starts milking the animal to the point where it says that the pot became completely full. She's like, this is, like there's no explanation for how that much milk would come out of one animal. But he fills up the pot. And then he says, drink, ishribi. Ya ummi ma, ya ya umma ma'bad, ishribi. He says, O oh, ummu ma'bad, drink. And she again, I, I, I'm trying to emphasize that she's a woman of character. She says, Ishrab fa anta ahaku bihi. You drink, you deserve it more. You are my guest. You are my guest, and you're the one that's brought this, you know, blessing to us. فَرَدَّهُ عَلَيْهَا فَشَرِبَتْ But look at the character of the Prophet ﷺ. She didn't say, No, you drink, you're more deserving. And he said, Okay, thank you. Right? The Prophet ﷺ said, no, 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 you drink. Insisted until she finally drank. And he told her, drink more and more. Then he said, bring me another one of the goats, or another one of the sheep. And then again he started, said, Bismillah, made dua to Allah, and started milking the animal until he filled up the pot again. And then he made uh, the, the guide that was with them on the trip, he made him drink. Then again he calls for another, to drink to his full. Drink more, drink more, drink more. And then he fills up another thing with another animal, another bowl. And then he makes Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu drink till he's full. And the Prophet sallallahu in one narration, he even says uh, at this time, سَاقِيُ الْقَوْمِ آخِرُهُمْ سَاقِيُ الْقَوْمِ آخِرُهُمْ The Prophet sallallahu said, the one who provides something to drink for the people, the server of the people, like خَادِمُ الْقَوْمِ آخِرُهُمْ he says the one who serves the people, he drinks last, he eats last, he eats after his guests are done. I'm taking care of y'all today. Y'all are my guests. So everybody has, because Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala was like, no, no, no. It's impossible. I just cannot drink before you. And the Prophet said, La, this is the rule. Now again, he's like, man, this obedience thing is like a tough gig, right? And so again, he's got to drink. Because the Prophet said, no, no, you drink. Right? So again, he drinks. And then finally the Prophet ﷺ is the last one to drink. And some narrations say he even fills up some extra because he says that when your husband comes home, when your family is, you know, when the rest of your family members are here, then you need to be able to provide for them as well. So, now in a couple of different narrations, she, uh, there's a few different narrations here. One of them is that, she doesn't remember that, that she asked the Prophet wasallam at this time um, that you have to tell me who you are. You have to tell me who exactly you are because this is unbelievable what I've seen, what I witness here. So you need to tell me exactly who you are. The Prophet of Allah wasallam tells her, asks her that 
can I trust you with a secret? Can I trust you with a secret? And she says, absolutely. So the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, yes, she says, I found the narration. She says, Billahi man anta. By Allah, I make Allah the witness. Tell me who you are. For wallahi ma ra'aytu mithlaka qattu. I swear to God, I've never seen anyone like you ever. Qala awatura, uh, he says, awatura ka taktumu alayya hatta ukhbiruki. He says, the Prophet ﷺ says that, is it possible that I tell you, but then you will keep it to yourself? And she says, yes, I'll keep it to myself. So the Prophet ﷺ informs her, فَإِنِّي مُحَمَّدُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ I am Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah. Um, and then she says, أَنْتَ الَّذِي تَزْعُ مُنْ قُرَيْشِ أَنَّهُ صَابِ the, She says, are you the same one that the Quraysh says that, who has abandoned the religion of the forefathers? The Prophet ﷺ says, doesn't say, yes, I'm that person. He says, إِنَّهُمْ لَيَقُولُونَ ذَلِكَ That's what they say. But that's not who I am. So then she responds by saying, فَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّكَ نَبِيٌّ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مَا جِئْتَ بِهِ حَقٌّ وَأَنَّهُ لَا يَفْعَلُ مَا فَعَلْتَ إِلَّا نَبِيٌّ وَأَنَا مُتَّبِّعُكَ that she says, she responds by saying that I bear witness, I give testimony that you are a messenger, you are a prophet, and what you have come with is the truth, and that nobody could do what you just did except for a prophet, and that I want to follow you. The Prophet ﷺ tells her that you can, in Naki, you cannot follow me today. But when you hear that I have settled, and my community has been established, then come and see me. Some other narrations give a slightly different account, but it ends up in the same conclusion. Some of the other narrations say that the Prophet ﷺ basically then, you know, after this whole incident is over, she thanks the Prophet ﷺ profusely, she's blown away by this entire experience. But then the Prophet ﷺ leaves from there. Now, one of the narrations says that, she starts just referring to the Prophet ﷺ. One narration says she sees Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu as they're leaving the next morning. And she asks Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu that you, you, you were with the guy, Al-Mubarak. She just refers to him as Al-Mubarak, the blessed man. You were with the blessed man yesterday. Who is it? And he says, you don't know who he is? She says, no, I don't know. She says, he tells her that he is a messenger and a prophet of Allah. And I need you to not give up our information in the route, the direction that we're going in. Another narration mentions that eventually her husband comes back home. And when her husband comes back home and he sees like a big old pot full of milk, a big old gallon full of milk, he says, where is this from? Our goats, our sheep all dried up, where did all this milk come from? And she says, a man came. He says, what man? Explain to me who this man was. And she, one narration says that she just says he was a very blessed man. And in one narration, she gives a description of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is the famous description of Ummu Ma'bad that is one of the bases of the famous description of the Prophet sallallahu that is found in the Shama'il of Imam Tirmidhi rahmahullahu ta'ala. The Shama'il of Tirmidhi, the very intimate, very beautiful, you know, description of the Prophet sallallahu and how he looked. One of those narrations is from the narration of Ummu Ma'bad. She describes the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa to her husband. She says, La wallahi, إِنَّهُ مَرَّ بِنَا رَجُلٌ مُبَارَكٌ She says, a very blessed man passed by here. كَانَ مِنْ حَدِيثِهِ كَيْتَ وَكَيْتَ He spoke like this and he spoke like that. فَقَالَ صِفِيهِ لِي So the husband says, describe him to me. She says, فَوَاللَّهِ إِنِّي لَا أَرَاهُ صَاحِبَ قُرَيْشِ Or rather he says, فَوَاللَّهِ إِنِّي لَا أَرَاهُ صَاحِبَ قُرَيْشِ أَلَّذِي تَطْلُبْ He says, because I think the man who came by here was the same man that all of Quraysh is looking for. So describe him to me. فَقَالَتْ رَأَيْتُ رَجُلًا ظَاهِرَ الْوَضَاءَ I saw a man who just had this, this, this air about him. He had this presence, this awe-inspiring presence. He lit up the room. Hassan al-Khalq He had the most beautiful character. Malih al-Waj His face was so inviting and welcoming. لَمْ تَعِبْهُ ثُجْلَةً وَلَمْ تُزِرْ بِهِ صَعْلَةً 
she describes the Prophet ﷺ, she says that he was not like very, he wasn't very heavy set, very overweight, nor was he very like rail thin. But he had a very medium build. Qasimun wasimun. He was very well proportioned and very balanced. Fi aynehi da'ajun. His eyes were very like, they, they had this, like they were very dark, they were very gripping, very compelling. وَفِي أَشْفَارِهِ وَطَفٌ And uh, she says that his eyelashes were very long. وَفِي صَوْتِهِ صَحَلٌ And she says that his voice <clears throat> was very sharp, like he didn't have like a dry raspy voice, kind of like mine. She, he had a very nice, clear, precise voice. When he spoke, it was very clear. Ahwa. She describes that his eyes were very, like, like very big, like you know, they were they were very open. Like his eyes seemed very open. Akhal, but at the same time, it was almost like there was like he had like uh, like he had a, like his eyes um, had a very dark circle around them. They were dark in color, very compelling. Azadju akranu. Then she goes on to describe the Prophet ﷺ that you know his um, he he was uh, his eye his eyebrows his eyebrows were also very thick and very deep. She goes on to describe that his neck was like long, not again like freakishly long, but it's not like he was like again like you know, uh, overweight and stubby or chubby, but his neck was very clear. And she says that his uh, beard was thick. When he sat there quietly, he just inspired awe. Like he had a, an air of dignity about him when he sat there quietly. وَإِذَا تَكَلَّمَ سَمَا وَعَلَاهُ الْبَهَاء But when he spoke, he had this presence about him. He had this presence about him. Like everything in the room, just he became the center of the room when he spoke. حُلْوُ الْمَنْطِقِ He was very, you know, very sweet in the way that he spoke. فَصْلٌ He spoke very clearly. He articulated himself very clearly and precisely. لا نزر ولا هذر When he spoke, he did not speak too little to the point where you didn't understand what he was talking about, nor did he speak so excessively where it's like, okay, when's he gonna finish? But he had like balance about him and even in the words that he chose. كَأَنَّ مَنْتِقَهُ خَرْزَاتُهُ نَظْمٍ يَنْحَدِرْنَا she says that when he spoke, they were like beads, like pearls in a necklace, like a pearls in a necklace in a string. It's like they were falling. When he spoke, every word out of his mouth was like a gem, was like a pearl that was falling. Abhan Nas. He was the most awe-inspiring of people I've ever seen. Wa ajmaluhu min ba'idin. And from afar, you were just gripped by the presence and the beauty of this man. وَأَحْلَاهُ He was the most sweetest and the most, you know, uh, friendliest of people that you've ever spoken to. وَأَحْسَنُهُ مِنْ قَرِيبٍ And as he came closer to you, you just became more and more and more impressed with him. رَبَعَةٌ لَا تَشْنَأُهُ عَيْنٌ مِنْ طُولٍ she goes on to describe that the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wasn't too tall, he wasn't too short, but he was very, you know, just a very average, perfect height. Another thing that she says that at the same time though, he was a little bit taller than maybe the average person, but not so tall where you became intimidated by him. وَلَا تَقْتَحِمُهُ عَيْنٌ مِنْ مِنْ قَصَرٍ At the same time, nobody could ever look down on him because, uh, because of being so short. He just had this perfect height about him. غُسْنٌ بَيْنَ غُسْنَيْنِ He was like a branch between two branches. Like he just fit perfectly. He just fit perfectly wherever he was. فَهُوَ أَنْضَرُ الثَّلَاثَةِ مَنْضَرًا There were three people with them, but you couldn't take your eyes off of them. Like there were three people traveling, Abu Bakr, the Prophet ﷺ, and their, their guide on the journey. But you couldn't take your eyes off of him. 
وَأَحْسَنُهُمْ قَدًّا And he was just the most amazing out of the three people. لَهُ رُفَقَا يَحُفُّونَ بِهِ And these people that were around him, it's like they just huddled around him. They were always attentive to him. They gravitated towards him. إِنْ قَالَ إِسْتَمَعُوا لِقَوْلِهِ When he spoke, then they listened to him very carefully. وَإِنْ أَمَرَ تَبَادَرُوا لِأَمْرِهِ If he's asked them to do something, they at once jumped into action to do it. مَحْفُودٌ مَحْشُودٌ She goes on to describe the Prophet ﷺ that they would, they gathered around him and they were waiting at his every beck and call. عَابِسٌ وَلَا مُنَفَّذٌ She goes on to describe the Prophet ﷺ that he was not so humble where you would take him for granted. Like he wasn't meek in a sense where you wouldn't take him seriously, but he wasn't arrogant either. So then her husband says, هَذَا وَاللَّهِ صَاحِبُ قُرَيْشِ أَلَّذِي تَطْلُو He says, وَاللَّهِ I swear to God this is exactly the man that Quraysh is looking for. وَلَوْ صَاد وَلَوْ صَادَفْتُهُ لَلْتَمَسْتُ أَنْ أَصْحَبَهُ وَلَا أَجْهِدَنَّا وَلَا أَجْهَدَنَّا إِنْ وَجَدْتُ إِلَى ذَلِكَ سَبِيلًا And he says that if I would have, could have gotten here before he left, I would have gone with him. If I could have gotten, if I would have gotten back before he left, I would have gone with him. And then he says that I'm going to try as hard as I can to eventually find my way to him. Another narration says that some of some other people who I guess were looking for the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they came by there and they said that فَسَأَلُوا عَنْهُ right they حَتَّى بَلَغُوا أُمَّ مَعْبَدْ they reached أُمَّ مَعْبَدْ some of a uh, uh, a search party from Quraysh فَقَالُوا أَرَأَيْتِ مُحَمَّدًا have you seen Muhammad? So she said, uh, مِنْ حِلْيَتِهِ كَذَا وَكَذَا And they started describing the Prophet He looks like this, he looks like that, he's got this person with him, that person with him. Have you seen him? Have you seen him? فَوَصَفُوهُ لَهَا They started describing the Prophet ﷺ. فَقَالَتْ مَا أَدْرِي مَا تَقُولُونَ I don't know what you people are talking about. Stop talking. Just too much noise. You're just making a lot of noise. I don't know what you're saying. Nobody cares about anything you're talking about. And she just tells them, da qadas. قَدَ ضَافَنِي حَالِبُ الْحَائِلِ All I know is that a man came here who was able to get milk out from a malnourished goat. That's all I know. There was a man here who found a way to milk a goat that has no milk in it. That's all I know. فَقَالَتْ قُرَيْشٌ فَذَاكَ الَّذِي نُرِيدٌ That's exactly who we're looking for. That's exactly who we're looking for. Subhanallah. Like even these people. Right? She says, I don't know who you're looking for. All I know is that a man came by here and he knew how to milk a goat that has no milk in it. And he said, ah, oh, that's the guy. That's exactly the guy we're looking for. So this is the beautiful narration of Ummu Ma'bad. How does Ummu Ma'bad's story end? How does the story of Ummu Ma'bad end? So the narration says, فَكَانَتُ سَمِّهِ الْمُبَارَكَ From that day on, She always used to talk about the Prophet ﷺ. And she used to call him Al-Mubarak, Al-Mubarak. The blessed man, the blessed man. Until one day, eventually once the Prophet ﷺ had you know, settled in Medina, she came to visit the Prophet of Allah ﷺ. And the narration says that when she came there, فَأَدْخَلَهَا فَأَطْعَمَهَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم وَأَعْطَاهَا When she came to visit the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ welcomed her into his home. And the Prophet ﷺ himself served her food. And the Prophet ﷺ himself went and got her something and gave it to her as a gift. He honored her. He hosted her. He dignified her. This is the character of Rasulullah ﷺ. This is why, and this is how people fell in love with the Prophet ﷺ. No good deed ever went... Uh, uh, ever went unappreciated. The Prophet ﷺ never forgot anyone's kindness or anyone's goodness. The smallest good deed would bring you such favor, such love from the Prophet of Allah ﷺ that it, it, was, it, would, it was an experience to just be with him, to be around him, to be in his presence. 
showered love on people. We oftentimes today talk about, you know, da'wah and spreading the message and spreading the word. But do we, do we, do we pour love on people in this manner? Do we show such character, such generosity, such, you know, kindness to people? He enters her into his home, he serves her food, he gives her gifts. And then the narration goes on to say that he gives her, you know, fakasaha. One other narration says that he gave her like clothes as gift and wa'ataha, and he gave her a lot of other gifts. And the narration goes on to say, wala a'lamuhu illa qala wa aslamat. And the narrations mention Imam al-Bayhaqi and many other scholars of the seerah mention the fact, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullahu ta'ala also mentions the fact that she ended up accepting Islam. She eventually came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Another narration also mentions Abu Nu'aym in Dala'il al-Nubuwa. He also mentions that Balaghani anna umma ma'bad hajarat wa aslamat wa lahiqat bi Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa He says, as far as I have confirmed from my study of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ummu Ma'bad eventually migrated to Medina accepted Islam and stayed there in the company to be a companion of Rasulullah sallallahu Sahabiya Ummu Ma'bad radiallahu ta'ala anha, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with her. And so this is a very fascinating, a very beautiful story from the journey of the Prophet sallallahu from Mecca to Medina. And I guess before, so we still haven't quite reached the, uh, the occasion where the Prophet sallallahu actually arrives in Quba, before he even arrives in Medina, but there is one other story that I'd like to share and then inshallah uh, from the next session on then we'll actually be um, we'll, we'll be talking about the Prophet Wasallam's arrival to first Quba, the suburb of Medina and then on to al Madina al Munawwara. But I'd like to share one last story from this journey and then we'll talk about his arrival. This is a narration that Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullahu ta'ala has mentioned. And he authenticates this narration generally. Ibn Kathir rahimahullahu ta'ala then also from Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal mentions it in his collection on the seerah as well. And basically the story is that when the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was traveling, they passed through kind of like a mountain pass. So it's Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and their guide. They went through a mountain pass that was known for there being two, um, what they, what the, the literal translation of the word, a list. A list refers to like, uh, highway robbers. It's called highway robbers. And what that basically means is, like people, like two guys were very notorious on that path who worked together and they used to what would be our equivalent of carjack people. They would carjack people. As people were kind of passing through there, you know, they stop at the stoplight, then they would run up and they would carjack them. They would rob people on this route, on this path. Unsus unsuspecting travelers, novice travelers, who were passing through this mountain pass, they would rob them. So the Prophet of Allah ﷺ heard about them. Their guide, he tells them, we should not go through this mountain pass, we should look for a way around. Because in the mountain pass, because once you get inside, and then you're kind of like boxed in. Then these two thieves on this route, they attack you and then they rob you and they take everything. So he tells the Prophet ﷺ, I strongly advise that we try to find a way around here. The Prophet of Allah ﷺ tells him, فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ خُذْ بِنَا عَلَيْهِمَا خُذْ بِنَا عَلَيْهِمَا Take us to them. He doesn't just say, okay, fine, or we'll risk it. No, no, no. The Prophet ﷺ says, in fact, not only will we go down to this mountain pass, but I want you to try to get their attention. I'd like to meet them. خُذْ بِنَا عَلَيْهِمَا So he says, fine, you're the boss. فَخَرَجْنَا حَتَّى إِذَا أَشْرَفْنَا إِذَا أَحَدُهُمَا يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِي هَذَا الْيَمَانِ هَذَا الْيَمَانِ when they get there, one of them, they're, they're kind of, you know, hiding out from where they ambush people. One of them says to another, this Yamani man, 
Like referring to just the, 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 the Prophet ﷺ, because what he's re- referencing is the fact that the forefathers of the Prophet ﷺ were from, you know, the, the Yamani tribes. And so he says this Yamani man, this Yamani individual. فَدَعَاهُمَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ So the Prophet ﷺ sees them, and he calls them, please come here, I'd like to talk to you. And they're like, first time this has ever happened. <laughs> right? Like, hey, how's it going? Come here, you mind if I talk to you? And they're like... Yes, what would you like to talk about? Right? So it's ajeeb. So they're entranced. فَعَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمُ islam. The Prophet ﷺ says, Please have a seat, I'd like to talk to you about Islam. فَدَعَاهُمَا إِلَى islam. He calls them to Islam. فَأَسْلَمَا And they both accept Islam. ثُمَّ سَأَلَهُمَا عَنْ أَسْمَائِهِمَا then after they accept the psalm, the Prophet ﷺ says, Well, tell me what's your names? What are your names? Tell me your names. فَقَالَ نَحْنُ الْمُهَامَان نَحْنُ الْمُهَانَان Muhan in the Arabic language means somebody who is disgraced, humiliated. Disgraced, humiliated. نَحْنُ الْمُهَانَان We are known as the two disgraced. Individuals, the two humiliated individuals, the two wretched men. And those that they were called that by the people who would travel through that area, they would call them the two wretched men. Because they used to rob people, they used to kill people. So they say, Nahnu al Muhanan. We are the two wretched, the two humiliated people. The Prophet of Allah وسلم, says, Fakala bal antuma al mukraman. No, rather you two are two honorable individuals. You are two honored individuals. وَأَمَرَهُمَا أَنْ يَقْدَمَا عَلَيْهِ الْمَدِينَةَ And then the Prophet of Allah ﷺ told them that I am on my way to, now that they became Muslim, and the Prophet ﷺ says, no, don't do this anymore, and don't consider yourselves humiliated, debased, wretched, consider yourselves honored, honorable, respected people. And then he says, when I reach Medina, make sure you come and you see me there. And again, we learn a, a very, very powerful lesson from the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number one, the obvious lesson, the low-hanging fruit here is, look at how the Prophet Sallallahu engages with people. You know, a lot of times something very interesting and fascinating is, you know, oftentimes we talk about hope. This is an issue of hope, right? People having hope. People hoping, having hope that they can improve, that they can better themselves. A lot of times people lose hope, they give up hope, they don't always need a lecture on hope. But a lot of times people give up hope, they give up on themselves, because others have given up on them. If you tell somebody long enough that you're a bad person, you're a bad person, you're a bad person, you're a bad person, a bad person guess what, eventually that person believes that they are a bad person. They will look in the mirror and they will see a bad person. Everybody around that person reaffirms somebody can make a mistake, somebody can do something wrong. But when all, everyone around them, all of society, the whole community reaffirms it and reminds them of it and labels them with it, they, then people resign themselves to that fate. And sometimes all that they need to break that vicious cycle is somebody to have some hope in them, somebody to see some good in them, somebody to show them the good that they have in them that they can no longer see. That's what sometimes people need. And that was a great quality of the Prophet ﷺ. That he tells them, no, you are two honorable individuals. And they become Muslim. And what do we call somebody who accepts Islam and sees the Prophet ﷺ in person and interacts? These people shook the hand of Rasulullah ﷺ. What do we call people like that? Sahaba. These are two companions of the Prophet ﷺ. You want to hear a success story? You want to hear a success story? This is a success story. Two men who are notorious for robbing and killing people on the road, in the wilderness, out in the middle of nowhere, taking advantage of isolated travelers, they accept Islam and become companions of the Prophet ﷺ. رضي الله تعالى عنهما May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them. That's a success story. But how did the Prophet ﷺ contribute to the success of these two people? He had hope in them. He inspired hope within them by showing, by respecting them. That's really what it boils down to. Treating them with dignity and respecting them. Great quality of the Prophet ﷺ. We have to really think about this. We have to reflect on this. You know, 
Something I think about oftentimes because we oftentimes will talk about the situation of our society and our community and people today and the level of deprivation and irreligiousness and the evil that is predominant in society. And we oftentimes, you know, will we talk about this? This is a huge challenge that we have. But at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, evil was also very predominant. Things were very bad. People were involved in a lot of nasty, terrible, messed up stuff. But look at the dignity, the hope, the, 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 the integrity, the respect with which the Prophet ﷺ dealt with people, engaged with people, interacted with people. And he turned their hearts. He inspired them to believe in themselves. Sometimes somebody's got to believe in themselves before they can actually even fully embrace iman properly. That type of hopelessness in oneself only leads to further hopelessness in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sometimes you have to lift somebody up, you have to pick somebody up, so that they actually have the strength to embrace iman and put their faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't even have faith in themselves anymore. They don't even think they're worthy of having a relationship with Allah. What are you going to do with that? Keep telling them, like quoting a hadith to them about the obligation to pray five times a day, and then continue to treat them like garbage? That doesn't work. It, it never, it's never worked. But the Prophet ﷺ lifted people back up. And then they took flight with their iman. They just needed to be lifted up. They needed somebody to reach a hand out, not treat them like a dirty, filthy animal. Not treat them like a dirty, filthy animal. It's like, no, I'm not touching that. I'm not touching that. Get away from me. The Prophet ﷺ would reach his hand out, pick these people up with his own hands, he would embrace them, he would hug them. And these people would take flight. And that's a powerful lesson from the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And the second thing, the second lesson from this incident, this is something I, I, I really want, I say this to, to remind myself, but I really, really hope everyone is really listening and paying attention to this part. What is the Prophet ﷺ doing? He's on the hijrah. This is the single greatest journey that any human being has ever taken in the history of mankind. No human being has ever taken a more, you know, important journey ever. This is the greatest, most significant, most important, most auspicious journey any human being has ever taken. Why? Because the best of mankind took the best journey in all of the history of mankind. This is Muhammad Rasulullah on the journey of the hijrah, the migration, the establishment of the ummah. So the, he's, he's on such an important task. And then look at the hardship that he's under. So he's doing something very important, something very religious, something very important for Islam. And then look at the hardship that he's under. He's being chased by the enemy, being hunted down, barely surviving, sneaking through, taking the most dangerous route possible. And in spite of all of these circumstances, he's doing something so important, and he's already under so much pressure, and he still has time. He still has time. He still can go to the trouble. He still is willing to inconvenience himself. To the extent of going and tending, taking care of, looking after, interacting, talking with two thieves, two criminals. It, the Prophet ﷺ, how would we react in that? Like brother, I, yes, very good, very important. But brother, I'm very busy right now. I'm doing something very important. What we do is we drink our own Kool-Aid. Right? We sell, we buy our own stock. We prop ourselves up. This is ujub. It's like being enamored with yourself. I am doing something so great, I cannot be bothered by this riffraff. And this is a very common, very prevalent attitude in the ummah today. I, I, I hate to say it, it breaks my heart to say it. Scholars, even imams, activists, Volunteers, organizers, workers, organizational leaders. This is such a prevalent attitude in the ummah today. I'm doing something very important. I cannot be bothered with the riffraff. Right? 
such a prevalent attitude, but this was not the attitude. Nobody, anybody who tries to say, oh brother, you know, that's too simplistic of a view. There are people who have to work at a higher level. We need people to work at a higher level. I don't care who you are, what you've convinced yourself that you are doing, nobody is at a higher level than Muhammad Rasulullah And the Prophet ﷺ had the time and the ability and the willingness to go and sit down with a couple of criminals. He had that time. And let me tell you something else very important about the prophetic model of tarbiyah. The Prophet ﷺ did this not only because it was the right thing to do, it was a necessary thing to do, he also did it to teach us something. That when we are involved in working, with the, working for the deen and the religion, and we do eventually get to a level where we are doing something at a very big high level, uh, you know, in terms of service uh, of the deen and the ummah, and the higher of a level that we get to, the more important that it becomes that we from time to time, that we regularly make out time to come back down to level, the ground level. We come back down to the ground sometimes, and interact with the people on the ground. Engage with the people down, you know, in the filth that the people are in. When we climb way up high onto our ivory members, and we're sitting around our big, you know, executive meeting desks, and we're sitting in our lofty, prestigious offices and conferences and councils and whatever somebody's, you know, area of work in the Ummah is, it is very important that every now and then you roll up your sleeves, you go down there and get your feet dirty, get your hands dirty. Otherwise you'll lose sight of what's important. Muhammad Rasulullah ﷺ had time. He inconvenienced. How, how much are we willing to inconvenience ourselves for the people? It was a powerful lesson our teachers always used to remind us. Always remember every single time you see anyone, a man, a woman, an elderly person, a child, no matter who the person is, where they're coming from, what's going on with them, remember this is a human being. This is a human being and this is a potential ummati, follower of the Prophet ﷺ, this person, this person right here in front of me, is the same person that the Prophet ﷺ would make dua for all night long. That the Prophet ﷺ would cry for. That the Prophet ﷺ shed his tears and his blood and his sweat for. He sacrificed for, he prayed for these people. And he will intercede on this person's behalf on the Day of Judgment. And so it is an honor and a privilege for me to be able to be at the service of this person, to be able to serve this person. And the second I think I'm too good for that, I need to go back and I need to really think about what I'm actually doing and who am I doing it for. Am I now still serving Allah? Am I still serving the deen of Allah? Am I still following in the footsteps of Muhammad Rasulullah who sat down with a couple of criminals on the journey of the hijrah, risked everything for the salvation of two men? Or am I at this point in time feeding more of my ego and my own image of myself? My self-projected image of myself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to serve the deen of Allah as the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam demonstrated for us. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanallah.